Now turn to part one. Part one. You will hear a conversation between Annetta and Charlotte, first year university students, and Bill, who works for the Student Union Employment Service. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions one to five. Hi Bill, this is my friend Charlotte. She's doing first year science too. Pleased to meet you Charlotte. Annetta told me you want some part-time work. Now, I just have to complete your details on the computer. Um, what's your surname? Johnston. With an E? Yes, J-O-H. N-S-T-O-N-E. I know that you live in the Heathfield Street student residence, but I can't remember the street number there. It's 126. 126. Good. And the phone number? Well, actually, I never give people that number because sometimes nobody answers or they forget to pass on the messages. So... I bought a mobile phone yesterday, but I can't remember the number. I think it's 0414847748. I'll just check. No, sorry, not 748, it's 749. 0414. Eight four seven seven four nine. Yes, that's right. I must try and remember it. And what sort of work are you looking for? Well, anything really, I suppose, though it depends when it is. I'd rather work during the day, if that's possible. How many hours a week were you thinking of? Oh, I'm not sure. Maybe about ten? but I need to keep at least two days a week free for study. Do you have any work experience? Not much, though I used to help in my uncle's shop when I was at school. OK, well, I'll put it in, but we don't usually get shop work. What about gardening? I'd rather not. Everything I touch dies. What other kinds of work are there? Well, there's a, a lot of demand for house cleaning, fast food preparation and kitchen work and pizza delivery if you've held a driving licence for 12 months. I'm not sure. Can I have a look at the vacancies while you talk to Annetta? Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Bill, I'd like to change my job. You're at the Hamburger Express on the High Street, aren't you? What's the problem? Well, I never know what hours I'm going to work. I start at 7pm and I'm supposed to finish at 11pm, but sometimes they keep me until 2 or 3am. Yes, that is a bit late if you have to make a 9am lecture the next day. And the other thing is the pay. They're supposed to pay me on Thursdays, but they never pay me on the correct day, often not until Friday or Saturday. A few weeks ago, I had to wait until Sunday. They said their son was sick, so they couldn't get to the bank, but they're always making excuses. Yes, that doesn't sound too good. Would you be interested in pizza delivery? You need to have a driving licence. Yes, I've got a licence. But I think I'd like to change from working in the evening. Are there any day jobs available? 
Well, as I told Charlotte, there are several cleaning and gardening vacancies. Uh, and this childcare job that just came in this morning. Do you like children? Yes, I do, actually. What's the job? Let's have a look. Collect the boy aged four from kindergarten at 3 p.m. Pick up the other two girls who are aged six and nine from the primary school at 3.15. You take them home and look after them. The parents will be home by seven. That sounds quite good. What about the pay? It's the same as you're earning now, four hours a day, Monday to Friday, so 20 hours a week. You need to contact Mrs uh, Alicia Thompson. Her phone number is 91045629 and she lives in Springfield. I've never been to Springfield. I hope I don't get lost. Don't worry. It sounds quite straightforward. Let's have a look at the street directory. The Thompsons live here in Tulip Street, number 252. So you catch the 631 bus, get off here next to the post office in Daisy Terrace. Walk past the post office to the corner and on the opposite corner is the kindergarten. Then walk down Daffodil Place and cross over to the primary school. Then keep going down Daffodil Place to the corner and turn right into Tulip Street. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part 2 You will hear a recorded message about a bus tour. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Thank you for calling the phone line for the Pacton on Sea bus tour. This is a recorded message lasting approximately four minutes, and it provides general information on the town bus tour. Pacton on Sea is a beautiful West Coast town and has attracted tourists for many years. One of the best ways of getting to know the town is to take the bus tour, which provides a wonderful viewing experience from one of our open-top buses. The tour is a round trip of the town, and there are a total of four stops where passengers can get on and off the bus. A lot of people start at the first stop, which is at the train station, as this is where many tourists arrive in the town. The next stop after the station 
is the aquarium, which is famous for its dolphin show, and which has recently expanded to include sharks. This is well worth a visit and is very reasonably priced. Leaving the aquarium, the bus tour goes along the coast road and after a few kilometers comes to the old fishing village where you can get off to stroll along the waterfront. There are some original buildings here, but most of the area has been modernized and is now used as a harbor for all kinds of sea craft, including yachts and some amazing powerboats. The tour then heads off to the last stop, and this is where most of the shops are. So for those of you keen to do a bit of shopping, this is the place for you. Our advice is to go to this part of the town in the morning when it is relatively quiet. It does get very busy in the afternoons, especially at the height of the season. This area of the town includes an ancient water fountain where many people like to have their photograph taken, so do look out for this. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you will have some time to look at the questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. Now, some details of the costs and timings. A family ticket, which includes two adults and up to three children, costs $30. An adult ticket costs $15. Children under the age of 15 are $5 and student tickets are $10 as long as you have a student card. All tickets are valid for 24 hours, which means that you can get on and off the bus as many times as you like within a 24-hour period. So you could, for example, start the tour in the afternoon and complete it the following morning. The first bus of the day leaves the station at 10 a.m. and the last one of the day leaves at 6 p.m. Buses leave every 30 minutes and each tour takes a total of 50 minutes. There are many attractions at each of the stops, so wherever you get off the bus, there will be plenty to do. The bus tour tickets do not include entrance to any of these attractions apart from the museum, which is located near the aquarium. Some buses have local guides who will point out places of interest and will provide information on the town. However, we cannot guarantee that every bus will have a guide, and so we also have an audio commentary that has been specially recorded for the bus tour by the tourist office. Headphones are available on the bus, and these are easy to operate. There is no extra charge for these. Just plug in, select the required language, and adjust the volume. Due to the winter months being rather cold and wet in Pacton on Sea, the bus tours only operate from March to September. The weather is usually warm and sunny during these months, so remember to bring some sun protection, especially on hot days. And of course, it does occasionally rain here in the summer, so if the weather looks bad, remember to bring some rain wear. The bus tours are available no matter what the weather. At the height of the summer, the tours can get very busy, so you are advised to book. You can book tickets online, over the phone, and also at the station, and at any of the other tour stops. 
When booking over the phone, you can collect your tickets at any of the stops at the start of your tour. When you do it online, you can print your e-ticket, which you must remember to bring with you. Thank you for calling the Pacton on Sea phone line, and we look forward to seeing you soon on one of our tour buses. That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part 3 You will hear a conversation between an admissions officer and a manager from the university's technologies department. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Hello, I'm Randy Agotra from the Technologies Department. Ah, yes, good. I'm Dave Hadley. Thanks for coming to see me. That's OK. I believe you want us to do some work for you. Yes, that's right. Um, I'm responsible for student admissions to the college and I use a computer system to help process student enrolments and to do the timetabling. Uh -huh. But it really doesn't suit the way we work these days. It's over 10 years old, and although it was fine when it was first introduced, it's just not good enough now. OK, what problems are you experiencing? Well, 20 years ago, the college was quite small, and we didn't have the numbers of students or tutors that we have now. So the system can't handle the increasing volumes? Well, there's a lot more data now, and it sometimes seems the system has crashed, but in fact, it just takes ages to go from one screen to the next. Right. Is that the only problem? Well, that's the main one, but there are others. In the past, doing the timetabling was quite simple, but now we have a lot more courses, and what's made it complicated is that many of them have options. Right, but the system should allow you to include those. Well, no, it doesn't. It was supposed to. And a few years ago, we did ask someone from the technologies department to fix it, but they never seemed to have the time. Hmm. Are there any other issues with the system? Well, I've been given extra responsibilities, and so I have even less time to do the timetabling. If there was anything you could do, Randir, to make the process more efficient, that would be really helpful. Well, it sounds like you could do with an assistant, but that's obviously not possible. So what about having an online system that students can use to do their scheduling? How would that work? Well, it may mean less choice for students, but we could create a fixed schedule of all the courses and options, and they could then view what was available. And work it out for themselves. That sounds great. OK, so 
Um, we'll need to decide whether or not to improve the existing system or to build a completely new system. Well, I'd much prefer to have a new system. Quite frankly, I've had enough of the old one. OK, that'll probably take longer, although it may save you money in the long run. When were you hoping to have this in place? Well, it's January now, and the new intake of students will be in September. We need to start processing admissions in the next few weeks, really. Mm, well, it will take more than a few weeks, I'm afraid. As an initial estimate, I think we'll be looking at April or May to improve the existing system, but for a new system, it would take at least nine months. That would be October at the earliest. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. What are the next steps if we are to have a new system? Well, the first question is, do you have support from your senior management? Yes, I've already discussed it with them, and they're also keen to get this work done. OK, because I was going to say that's the first thing you need to do, and without that we can't go ahead. Yes, I've done that. That's good. Actually, they mentioned that there's probably a form I need to complete to formally start the project. Yes, that's the next thing you need to do. I'll send you an email with a link so you can fill it in online. It's called a project request form. OK, great. And then what happens? Well, I have a list of things, but I think the third thing you should do is see Samir. He's our analyst who will look at the system and identify what needs to be done. OK. Can you send me his contact details and I'll set up a meeting with him? OK, that's good. So we should soon be able to get a team together to start the work. Some members of our team work in different locations, so it's not easy to have face-to-face -face meetings. That's OK. I'm used to having conference calls, providing they're not late at night. <laughs> right. So I'll send you details of the team, and if you could set up a call, that would be great. OK, I'll do that. Thanks. That is the end of part three. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part three. Part 4 You will hear a lecture about how technology affects human interaction. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Good morning. Today, we're thinking about the way that technology is influencing our social structures and the way we interact with one another. Humans, as we know, have always lived in groups. Without this arrangement, our species would have died out long ago. But now, the way we see and define our group is changing. I'd like to start by mentioning the research of American sociologist Mark Granovetter in 1973. It was Granovetter who first coined the term weak ties, which he used to refer to people's loose acquaintances. In other words, friends of friends. His research showed that weak ties had a significant effect on the behavior and choices of populations. And this influence was something highly important in the fields of information science and politics, and as you can imagine, marketing also. So, these friends of friends, people we might spend time with at social or work gatherings, might not be like us, but they can still have a positive influence because we share the same sort of interests. That's enough to make a connection, and this connection can turn out to be more beneficial than we might suspect. An example of this, an example of how the connection can influence us, is when our weak ties get in touch and pass on details about jobs they think might be suitable for us. Well, since Granovetter first came up with this theory, His work has been cited in over 19,000 papers. Some of these studies have looked at how weak tie networks are useful to us in other ways. And one thing that seems to improve as a result of weak tie influence is our health. Today, our number of weak tie acquaintances has exploded due to the Internet. To the phenomenon of online social networking. This is still a relatively new way of communication, something that has a huge amount of potential. But also, as with any invention, it brings with it a new set of problems. Let's start with the benefits. Without question, online social networking allows us to pass on the latest news. To be up to date with local and global events. And for many, this information comes from sources more trustworthy than local media. So, this is one clear point in favor of online social networking. I know that it's also being used by students as a means of increasing their chances of success in the way that. Lecture notes can be shared and ideas discussed. I think, personally speaking, that we need some further research before we can definitively say whether it helps or not. There's also been a great increase in the number of networking sites devoted to sharing advice on health issues, but there are as yet no studies to prove the reliability of that advice. Now, what we do have clear evidence for is that people are developing friendships and professional networks in a way that wasn't possible before. The process is faster. I'm not talking about quality here, but simply that they exist. And it's debatable whether the number of online friends that you have increases your level of self confidence. That's perhaps an area of research some of you might be interested in following up. Turning to the problems, there are any number of articles connecting online activity to falling levels of physical fitness, but it's too easy to blame the internet for our social problems. The poor grades of school children are also frequently linked to the time spent on social networking sites. But it would be naive to believe there are no other contributing factors. One real concern, however, 
is the increase in the amount of fraud, where, for example, people are using the personal data of others, which they've put online, for criminal purposes. This kind of activity seems likely to continue. And then, certainly for employers, online social networking sites have provided a great time-wasting opportunity, reducing productivity like never before, and I doubt they can put a stop to this habit, no matter what restrictions are in place. We'll come back to these issues in a minute, but I'd like to say something about the theories of Robin Dunbar, an anthropologist at Oxford University. Dunbar has found that the human brain has evolved in a way that means we can only give real attention to a particular number of people. 150, apparently. So, for example, if the number of friends on your online network is greater than that, according to Dunbar, this would imply the relationships are only superficial. Dunbar is not against online relationships, but he maintains that face-to-face -face interaction is essential for the initial creation of true friendship and connections. He's concerned that for young people, if their only experience of forming relationships is online, this doesn't allow them to form the ability or acquire the strategies for maintaining relationships, for example, in situations where negotiation or diplomacy is required, or where it's essential for... That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. The IELTS speaking test is designed to evaluate your ability to communicate effectively in English. It consists of three parts, an introductory interview, a topic-based monologue, and a two-way discussion. To excel in this test, focus on fluency and coherence rather than memorizing answers. Speak confidently even if you make small mistakes, as self-correction shows natural communication skills. Use a wide range of vocabulary and grammar structures to demonstrate your proficiency. Practice talking about common topics like hobbies, travel, and education to prepare for part one. For part two, structure your response with an introduction. Main points and conclusion, ensuring you cover all aspects of the cue card. Practice talking about common topics like hobbies, travel, and education to prepare for part one. For part two, structure your response with an introduction. Main points and conclusion, ensuring you cover all aspects of the cue card. In part three, it's really important to provide thoughtful answers. Try giving examples or explanations to support your opinions. Record yourself speaking during practice sessions. This way you can identify areas for improvement. Finally, stay calm, smile and engage with the examiner naturally. Confidence and consistent practice are the keys to achieving your desired band score.